You're about to watch a great interview on TYT interviews. If you want to watch them live, members are the only ones who get to do that. TYTnetwork.com slash join, become a member, enjoy the interviews as they happen. So I'm here with Tim Sharak, uh, and Tim is somebody whose work I followed for I don't know how long years, and his expertise has become especially relevant now as we approach the summit in Singapore, June 12th, between President Trump, King, and Kim Jong Un. All uh, indications say that the summit will go forward, uh, despite Trump canceling it, and then putting it back on, and so forth. So, uh, hello, Tim. Good morning. Um, so you're going to be traveling to Singapore for the summit. Yes. Before we get into the substance, what is just what is your process going to be as you cover this as a traveling journalist there in a, in a foreign land? Um, what, just give some insight into how you're going to approach that uh, endeavor. Well, first, I'm mapping out where all the locations are. You know, my hotel in relationship to the White House press room. I have pre White House press credentials. So the White House press room is going to be in one hotel. Uh, there's the Singapore International Press Center. It's going to be another nearby hotel. And then, of course, the summit itself is in this island. It's very close by to that. And so I'm trying to, I've never been to Singapore before, so I'm trying to figure out the sort of logistics first. And uh, it's not clear exactly, you know, what kind of briefings there's going to be. I'm very curious to know if the North Koreans are going to have any kind of media presence or their own briefings, like I'm sure the White House is going to have. Uh, so, you know, first I'm going to be like really figuring out the lay of the land and what's possible. Uh, I'm going to be doing some video reports for the Korean news organization I work for, uh, which is called the Korea Center for Investigative Journalism. And uh, so I'm also going to be, you know, reporting and reporting on the press on this, because I think the story of the press and its coverage of North Korea and this summit in particular is really part of the broader story. So uh, I'll, be, I'll, look, I'll be looking at the summit itself and then, you know, how the press responds and, and uh, how it works out. And I hope to talk to people, you know, in Singapore who have some expertise in uh, it's, North Korea and, and the Koreas in general, uh, you know, to get some, to get, get in, input from them as well. Yeah, I mean, you think that the press is going to have a huge role in how this thing is interpreted internationally. So I think reporting on their behavior is almost as much of an imperative as reporting on the actual diplomatic machinations. Uh, when I'm at an event, something I always keep an eye out for is how the press sort of comport themselves um, because that's always an interesting facet of actually covering the covering the story. Um, because you know they often can behave in a herd like manner, uh, yep. and they're willing to just kind of transmit what officialdom tells them without much critical scrutiny. Um, and, and there's uh, also often often there you know, questions that they even ask are often distorted questions, you know, right. questions that don't really have any basis in fact. Right. And uh, so that's going to be interesting to see how that unfolds. Right. Their premises are loaded so as to elicit a certain response. Um, and, and the premise all usually isn't grounded in anything. Um, so you, you on the su subject of the press as it relates to the summit, you've been critical of the U.S. media's reaction to this forthcoming summit, especially liberal leaning media, um, as have I. Because it seems to me that the way that they've portrayed this summit to their readers and viewers is almost entirely through the prism of, is Trump going to get credit? He shouldn't get credit. Trump is bad. Therefore, the summit's bad. You know, a very simplistic, almost an insultingly simplistic version of events right. here. Uh, meanwhile, you have South Koreans seemingly putting a lot of stake in the outcome of this summit for their country's fortunes, potentially resolving the Korean War officially, which I know is something I've heard you talk about going back years when it seems almost like a very far-fetched prospect that that could actually happen. Now it seems to be, you know, very tangibly on the agenda. Um, so how do you, what's your basic distillation of how 
U.S. media and in particular the liberal media, and by, by liberal media I don't say that in the way that conservatives say it when they're saying all media. I mean the the media organs that are you know vociferously aligned with Democrats. So we don't have to name them in specific here, but we can. Um, so the the actual liberal media rather than the fantasy liberal media that conservatives often construct. How, how, how do you just how do you how do you distill how they've operated here? Well, from the very beginning, from the almost the moment that this meeting was announced when Trump agreed to meet with Kim Jong Un, you know, like for example, you know, Rachel Maddow on MSN, MSNBC, like freaked out the very first night, like how could this possibly happen? An American president has never met with a leader of North Korea, and there's reasons for that, and that was the fact that it had never happened before was her argument that it should not happen because Kim is such a bad guy and North Korea is such a bad country. Uh, the, the viewpoint of a lot of these reporters and these, these media outlets is that North Korea is so terrible that we should never give them any kind of, you know, e- equality at a, at a bargaining table or negotiating table. Uh, and there's no understanding of the past, very little understanding of the role the United States has played in Korea since 1945. And they're just a terrible, atrocious bombing campaign that the U.S. led during the Korean War that killed, you know, three million plus Koreans in North Korea. And so there's no understanding and very little explanation of, you know, why there is this hostility between North Korea and the U.S. and, you know, why they might act as they do, why they might develop nuclear weapons. And so that's a big piece that's that's missing here. And, uh, you know, and the rest of the press You know, like the New York Times, for example, uh, it it tends to just rely on, you know, the most, uh, you know, the establishment, North Korea, so-called experts, you know, people, Victor Cha at the Center for Strategic International Studies, you know, people at uh, Brookings Institution, these kind of these kind of people set the pace. They're usually very hard line. And so their line is always reflected in the news reports. And so. We have news coverage that just simply lacks history and lacks analysis of of why the situation, you know, reached such a, you know, critical, uh, critical point last year with the North Koreans, uh, you know, testing so many missiles and a hydrogen bomb in the U.S. through Trump, you know, threatening, uh, you know, fire and fury and total destruction. You know, why did that come to be? There's very little of that in in the U.S. press, and that's Part of what I've been trying to explain for years is, you know, why there is this uh, hostility and, and how uh, and the importance of of engagement and what it's done in the past to, to, to resolve some of these issues. And one irony here is that the, quote, hardline view, which much of the mainstream media outlets are expounding, is in this particular peculiar context also a slightly anti-Trump view because – He's taking a position, or so it would seem, that is not necessarily aligned with what the hawkish establishment would have taken, meaning he's willing to engage in this diplomatic endeavor with, with, with North Korea. So you have a situation where, especially in the, in the liberal-leaning media, putting out this hawkish interpretation of these events is actually also bundled up with putting out an anti-Trump position. So you, so they're taking, the, they have this notion that saying, oh, diploma, uh, North Korea is inherently uh, uh, unable to be reached. Um, diplomatic relations with North Korea is inherently undesirable, and and because Trump wants that, it's it's a fool's errand. So the the, the kind of perverse irony is that they're take in, in under the guise of this anti-Trump sentiment, they're actually taking a hardline position that is more in line with how the you know, hawkish establishment has has looked at this issue for going back years. Yeah, that's true. And, and the, the the hatred of, of Trump and, and the, the, the feeling that, you know, Trump should not be given any credit for anything is driving a lot of this coverage. And it's unfortunate because, you know, this is one thing he seems he seems to have done right. Uh, I mean, he's not only is he has he gone against the, the, the wishes of lots of the, uh, you know, the sort of establishment national security hawks in Washington, but he's, he's also played down the role of his own national security advisor, John Bolton. Uh, 
I mean, you know, this the summit was almost canceled uh, two weeks ago when a senior North Korean diplomat wrote an article, you know, ripping into Bolton's uh, proposals for, you know, a Libya type solution to North Korean denuclearization, which, you know, the North Koreans interpreted as, you know, uh, basically you know, regime change on steroids. I mean, basically, the idea is, you know, North Korea would, you know, give up its nuclear weapons b b b before getting any kind of economic benefits, any kind of lifting of sanctions. And of course, in the North Korean mind, they also know that, you know, a few years after Libya's Gaddafi gave up his weapons, uh, he was overthrown in a regime change operation by the United States and NATO. And so, you know, putting this forward is, is a ridiculous idea, and it's bound to be rejected by the North Koreans, and which they did very flatly. And then uh, after they wrote a letter about this, they wrote an article about this, Trump canceled, and then another North Korean official wrote, wrote another article right away, very conciliatory towards Trump. And, uh, you know, in the last couple of days, we've seen that, you know, John Bolton was iced out of the a meeting recently between uh, Trump and the very high level North Korean delegate who came here, uh, Kim Jong Chol, who met at the White House with Trump. You know, so I think, you know, just being against Trump is no reason to be against this. I mean, this is a process that's being driven by the Koreas, North and South Korea. You know, your, 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 your uh, audience probably remembers that, you know, this was set off during the Olympic Games in South Korea when, you know, just before the Olympics began, North Korea offered uh, to send a high level delegation to South Korea for these games and then, you know, to participate in the Olympics, which they did. And as a result of the discussions that happened in, in, in Seoul uh, during, during that time between North and South Korea, they set up this process and, you know, President Moon Jae-in, who ran for office, who ran for the presidency on a platform to defuse the crisis with North Korea and defuse the tensions with North Korea, you know, sent a delegation to North, to North Korea to meet with Kim Jong-un, who told his representatives that he was willing to, you know, have discussions with denuclearization with Donald Trump and invited Trump to meet with him and Trump accepted. So this has really been driven by the Koreas, and in particular, you know, Moon Jae-in, the president of South Korea, and that also is often left out of all the media reports. It's like South Korea hardly exists in these in their universe. Uh, it's just you know, it's just between the U.S. and North Korea, and they don't really understand. A lot of the media doesn't try to help the audience and Americans understand. You know, they're very complex political situation within South Korea and the relations between North and South Korea. So I think that's, that's you know, the, the Korea story is, uh, the, the role of the Koreas in this is very important. Yep. So, which is why obsessing about whether or not Trump see, receives credit is such a trivial aspect of all this. I mean, who ultimately right. cares whether Trump receives credit? And yet that, that, that narrative seems to be what's driving much of the media coverage, uh, especially on, on the you know, on the Democratic side and even, I guess, in the conservative media where you have a lot of, you know, hawkish conservatives who otherwise have an affinity for Trump now who are praising this decision, whereas in the past you could just as easily imagine them calling it appeasement, um, calling it, you know, getting in bed with a dictator. So you have a weird inversion of how the domestic political forces in the U.S. are, are perceiving this. That's true. And, uh, you know, I think I think it's still kind of focused on Trump, you know, and, and, and his, you know, pe people see as his uh, sort of, uh, you know, unwillingness to to follow the dictates of the past and follow normal diplomatic processes and, and that kind of thing. And, you know, it's I mean, obviously there's, you know, a ton of issues to to be critical of Trump about. Uh, my gosh. But I mean, you know, when when this is something that involves, you know, peace for a country that has seen war and division for seven years, you know, I think that's something that really should be applauded. And I myself, you know, think it was a brave and correct decision by Trump to meet with Kim Jong Un. And it's really set off a process where, you know, there's the deepest negotiations 
you know, since, you know, 18 years ago, uh, when the Clinton administration, uh, you know, was talking with them about ending their uh, missile program and, and nuclear program. Uh, so, you know, I think that, you know, the, the, the media really needs a lesson in Korean history. And, you know, what the role of the United States has been there, uh, not only, you know, in the Korean War, but, you know, since then. I mean, the, the, the U.S. supported, you know, dictators in South Korea for, you know, decades. And, you know, little is understood, little is known about that in the U.S. press. Very little is reported about that, that aspect of U.S. policy and, and, and how South Koreans view the United States. Uh, so I think, you know, Hopefully, they're going to get a lot of that, uh, you know, at, learn a lot about that as they as they cover this this summit and the ensuing negotiations that are going to they're going to happen afterwards. Now, you mentioned the influence of Bolton. There have been reports over the past couple of days from anonymous officials talking to CNN that Bolton intentionally attempted to undermine the the uh, summit talks by floating that. Libyan model suggestion. Um, I think that was pretty obvious to anybody uh, who was paying attention at the time. Uh, but the fact that Trump seems to have contravened Bolton's influence, I mean, that's notable in its own right. And then you have, on the other hand, Democrats issuing a letter this week signed by the top Democratic leadership in the Senate, you know, Schumer, Menendez, uh, Feinstein, etc., basically taking a view on the Korea summit that is more maximalist and uh, more, you might even say belligerent or hardline than Bolton, who is supposed to be the consummate hardliner. And he is in his, you know, as we, as the summit approaches, everybody should be cognizant of the influence that he's having. Actually, we at TYT uh, uh, reported a piece last week uh, showing that one of Bolton's key aides who took up a temporary job at the National Security Council, uh, you know, acting as a de facto chief of staff, uh, actually, you know, while he has that job on the National Security Council, maintains a affiliation with this hawkish think tank that's directly funded by, by Raytheon. And we know what Raytheon prob- presumably thinks about a summit like this. They want to be able to sell their weapon systems um, uh, for the for, for, until the end of time. And, uh, you know, peace on the Korean Peninsula is not necessarily conducive to that. So, you know, that's that's def- a definite danger, Bolton's influence, the influence of his orbit. But on the other hand, Democrats are sending this letter now to Trump saying we won't accept anything uh, for, out of the summit other than immediate denuclearization. And that was seen as the most unlikely and, and, and uh, delusional uh, demand that Trump could have right. could have made um, upon the North Koreans. So again, you have a situation where you have this very, very, uh, very insidious confluence of of uh, of influence. Yeah, what the Democrats are, are attacking Trump on this from the right, and they have an even more militant, as you said, a more militant posture on this than even Bolton. Uh, and you know what they're demanding is basically you know, what has been inconceivable to the North Koreans from the beginning, which is, you know, you surrender completely and then maybe we'll talk. You know, you have to surrender everything. You have to give up all your weapons, ship them out of the country before there's any kind of lifting of sanctions or any move toward, toward you know, normalization of ties or anything like that. So it's like you, you surrender first, then we'll, then we'll get together. And that's been unacceptable from the very beginning. And that's the whole reason to have the diplomacy and to have negotiations, because you know what what South Korea has proposed and also North Korea you know wants is a step by step process where you know like they're, the North Koreans are already showing signs like you know they they uh, destroyed uh, these this mountain these mountain tunnels where they tested their their nuclear weapons. Uh, although, you know, questions have been raised about whether they really did destroy it or not, but they invited reporters in to see the destruction. And, and then uh, the last couple of days, there's been, there's been reports uh, by knowledgeable experts uh, at the 38 North organization that follows North Korea, that they've actually uh, been dismantling one of, their, one of their large missile sites in North Korea in, in preparation for this. So, you know, they see it as like, you know, step by step. And obviously no country 
in their right mind is just going to like surrender all their weapons. And, and you know, North Korea developed a deterrent system of nuclear weapons and missiles to, in, in, to in their view, protect themselves from the possibility of, of a U.S. attack, a U.S. attempt at regime change. And that's their deterrence. That's their defense. And, it, and it, they, they, by developing that, they develop, they could, you know, negotiate out of a, a position of strength, which is what they're doing. And, and so these Democrats, by demanding an immediate surrender, are going back to like, you know, a year ago when before there was any kind of talks at all. And uh, their, their, their view is just unacceptable, not only to North Korea, but to South Korea. In fact, you know, the South Korean media, the, at least the you know, progressive press, was totally shocked by this letter, which, which they noted uh, was, you know, even worse than the positions put forward by John Bolton. So you have to wonder, you know, what exactly is the purpose of that? And, you know, I think uh, whatever agreement Trump comes away with, especially if there's a, an agreement to have a treaty to end the, formally end the Korean War, you know, that'll have to come before the, the Senate. And uh, I think the Democrats are signaling that without you know, there are hard line demands. They're, they're going to they're going to oppose any kind of agreement. And uh, we might recall that in 1994, when President Clinton uh, reached an agreement with North Korea about ending their nuclear program. This was, of course, before they actually had the bomb. Uh, at that time, uh, the North Koreans froze their nuclear weapons program, their plutonium program, for 12 years uh, under that agreement. And it was, you know, it was a very successful agreement. And they were on the verge of, the Clinton administration was on the verge of, um, you know, a missile agreement ending their missile program in 2000, which is when, you know, after that, the Bush administration came in and, and basically came into power with John Bolton as part of that administration to do away with the 94 agreement. But from the very moment that 94 agreement was signed, uh, it was signed in October 94. Uh, and then in November 94, you know, Newt Gingrich led the House, the Republican takeover of the House. And, and immediately the agreement was under attack by Republicans as appeasement. And, and they actually, you know, refused to provide the uh, funds, the government, U.S. government funds for part of the agreement, you know, shipping uh, U.S. fuel oil to North Korea in return for their uh, stopping their nuclear power program. And, you know, this caused some real problems in terms of the agreement. And North Korea felt the U.S. was uh, backing away from the agreement because of this congressional Republican-led uh, opposition. And so, you know, the same thing could happen, you know, in this situation. I think we should learn from history, uh, you know, that, you know, you know, we can't if we're gonna if we're gonna demand North Korea uh, hold to an agreement hold to agreements and you know, we have to hold to them as well. Yeah. So you know, in the run up to this summit, I've seen some chatter about how a formal end to the Korean War is going to be nothing more than a symbolic uh, victory. That it, if that is what is achieved out of the summit, it's just going to give Trump an opportunity to declare a hollow win. Um, and then it won't actually mean anything on the ground. Um, now, I think it's self-evident that there's no active combat at this point between, uh, as in the way that there was during the Korean War decades ago. I mean, that, nobody's disputing that. But, it, you know, I think people maybe in the U.S. can't really relate to the idea of having a state of what is technically perpetual war on your land uh, how, how that can affect your, how you, how you, you station yourself geopolitically. You're in a p war posture as much as that might ebb and flow over time. And you know, that has all kinds of ancillary effects on your domestic politics um, and obviously internationally. Uh, and, and it seems as, as though you know, that is being downplayed in the U.S. as meaningless. Um, what, what is your... What is your reaction to that? Well, like I, I grew up partly in South Korea in the aftermath of the Korean War. And, 
you know, I know what a terrible war it was for both sides. It was just, it was just atrocious violence, families separated, you know, millions killed, millions left homeless, cities destroyed, completely destroyed in North Korea, and years and years and years of repression on both sides of the DMZ. Uh, it, it, that was always uh, the, the repression was because of the threat from the north or the threat from the south in the case of the north. And so they have used the war, you know, to repress their own peoples. And, and also, you know, it's just this human element of so many people being divided and families being divided and wanting, you know, eventual unification of their country again and, uni and unification with their families. And, and, and that, that human dimension is missing so much from the, from the U.S. coverage. It's like, you know, ending a war is, is nothing. Well, ending a war for Korea is everything. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it has to do with every aspect of, of life on both sides of the DMC. And, you know, Korea was divided against its will. It was divided by the United States with, with the agreement of the Soviet Union to accept the surrender of Japan's colonial rule in Korea, which lasted from 1910 to 1945. And it, it was, you know, the, 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 it was, the, the, the division was supposed to be temporary. It was just supposed to last a few years. Uh, but because of the Cold War, uh, you know, the U.S. made decisions, you know, you know, keeping people, you know, keeping some of the former Japanese collaborators in power in the South. And uh, so, you know, very sort of right wing government formed in the South, communist government in the North, led by people who had fought the Japanese in the North uh, because, you know, there was there was guerrilla warfare against Japanese colonialism throughout throughout the war period. Uh, so, you know, this division, you know, hardened into this, you know, you know, t total division. And then, you know, a, a war began in the late 40s. And then, you know, in 1950, you know, of course, the North Korean army invaded and tried to, you know, push the U.S. completely out of the South. Um, and, you know, so these vivid memories from this war and the destruction that followed. And, you know, people in Korea want to get back to a situation where, uh, at least they can have reconciliation and move slowly towards some kind of, you know, unified system. It may not be like, you know, completely integration of North and South Korea, but they, you know, they, they want to start by projects, you know, and, you know, exchanges of, of like they've been doing, you know, sports exchanges, single, single Olympic teams, single teams in various sports, uh, economic projects, uh, and, and cultural, and then, you know, in transportation links and you know slowly increasing the uh, in, increasing the ties between North and South Korea, you know, and and really developing into a into a country that, uh, that so they can move forward without the threat of of war or, or attack and and spending so much on you know military, and so it's 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 a it's a win win situation for Korea, and. Uh, you know, you know, a lot of American strategic thinkers, you know, don't want to uh, lose the, the U.S. military position in South Korea. And, you know, our whole military apparatus in East Asia, Japan, Okinawa, Guam, is all aimed at, you know, supposedly, you know, containing and preventing, containing North Korea and preventing a North Korean invasion. So if you get a peace... Uh, there's no, you know, a lot of the pieces of that U.S. military structure in East Asia are no longer necessary. And so there's a lot of implications here long term. But, you know, peace is good. I just don't understand how anyone can oppose the idea uh, just because, you know, it's being brought about by an unpopular president. Yeah. Well, that's a very controversial statement you make now, apparently. This is good. Um, you know, the, the profundity of what you outlined there, again, just reinforces to me how ridiculous and how frivolous the emphasis of this American coverage has been. Um, because if 
you turn on the on the news or you know Google the, the most recent reports on this summit, you'll find stuff poking fun at the commemorative coin that was put out with Trump and Kim. You'll find stuff about how isn't it uh, isn't it outrageous that that the U.S. may pay for Kim's hotel lodgings. I mean, that stuff should be covered. I'm not saying it should be ignored. You know, so, and even some of it when it veers on on the absurd should be should be mocked. Um, but at the same time. Keep in mind the larger factors here and the larger uh, significance. And it seems to me that's just been totally missing. And it's a very damning indictment of just the the shallowness of, of much of the American press, which is why I think you are such a, um, a needed uh, voice here. Um, so uh, we're going to link to your uh, dispatches in the nation and uh, be be following your stuff as the summit approaches. Um, so, so good luck with everything and uh, thank, thank you. you for taking some time. I appreciate it very much, Bye. Michael. Thank you. If you like this interview and you're at the end, so apparently you liked it a little bit, thank you for watching. We really appreciate it. You can watch them live as they happen if you're a member. Only members get that. Go to tytnetwork.com slash join. And you get not only interviews live, you get the Young Turks live, you get Aggressive Progressive live, old school, and all the commercial free. Come join us right now, tytnetwork.com slash join.